Hello, loved ones. How are you doing today? Welcome, new subscribers. Thank you for subscribing to us. Thank you, subscribers, for following, sharing, liking our videos. We appreciate all your support. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. I came here today to do a book review on a book called Black Indians. It's a very popular book. I'm sure this is not the first time you've probably seen this image or seen this book. The book is by William Loring Katz, a white guy who wrote this book. I'm thinking that he was a Jew. Thinking he was Jewish. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Uh, the book is about 13 chapters, 187 pages. A very good read. My favorite part about this book is... And the biggest portion of this book is about the Black Seminoles. They were the most fierce Indian, Black Indian warriors on the, on the front line. I mean, they were fearless. Love that story. I lived in Oklahoma a little, a little while, so I've heard a little bit about the Black Seminoles. Uh, I lived in Seminole apartments as well. There's some Seminole apartments in Oklahoma. Uh, so yeah, if you ever see real Indians, they're going to look just like me. I promise you, they're going to just, they're going to look just like me and you. And my first time of seeing that was in Oklahoma. I was just shocked. The images that you see on TV is way different from the images that you see in real life. Those people look more dark like me and you. You know, I, I very seldom uh, saw like the Indians that you see on TV with the dark hair and look at Asian, Asiatic. I rarely saw Indians like that. I saw Indians in Oklahoma that look like me. Even here in Arkansas, I have saw Indians that look like me. Only a few, I've seen a few that have those features, but not many. Okay? And that's what makes me think that the darker Indians were here a lot longer than the red ones. Okay, and the ones that you see today that's lighter complected and look Asiatic, a lot of them have a lot of European blood in them. They did a lot of mixing with Europeans as well. All right, before I get into this book, you know, you guys know I've been doing some research on this. I've been doing, uh, coming here doing book reviews on this because this has been a very important topic to me because I found out. You know, I found out a long time ago that there are Blackfoot Indians in my family. So I'm really doing some extensive research, you know, on myself, finding out more about these ancestors that were here. Because just like many of us, we thought our ancestors were from Africa. Uh, Dane Calloway has did an excellent extensive research on this topic. My hat goes off to you, brother. It, you know, Ashe, you're doing a very good job you know you're doing a very good job what i didn't like doing this research i saw a lot of afrocentrics bashing dane calloway he never he didn't say anything against africa dane calloway is simply saying that some of us were already here and columbus reported some of this we can talk about the Florida Indian Indians. We can talk about the uh, Carolina Indians. We can talk to Cal about the California Indians. It was all black, dark-skinned people. You know, so when I saw Sarah Seti, he was really in into this, you know, they're so caught up into this pan-African stuff, it's more of a trend. So they're doing anything to defend it, even discredit the truth. You know, you're so caught up in this trend that you don't want to look at facts. Even when you looked at hidden colors, they're showing you when you go on to go to the Philippines, there are dark skinned people there. When you go to Mexico, there's dark skinned people there. You know, when you go to Fiji, there's dark skinned people there. You can find dark skinned people, Aborigines being the first inhabitants on these continents so it shouldn't surprise you that many of us did not come from africa we were already here you know i'm just so surprised that these afrocentrics they're so caught up in this pan-african movement they have no room for the truth that's just the way i see it you guys 
It's just the way I see it. And then you can look, you can... You can really tell that this civilization is possibly, the American civilization is possibly older than the African civilization because the pyramids here, there's pyramids here in America, the mounds, the pyramids, they they're predate some of the pyramids that you find in Africa. You know, some of the stuff here is way older than the stuff in Africa. We have a pyramid here in America that's way bigger than the pyramid there in Africa. So when we actually start looking at the history of America, looking at those ancient civilizations, we have to ask ourselves who was, you know, who who is the oldest civilization? You know, and you it comes with that with India too when you start looking at their oldest civilization. You know, they have this out of Africa uh, theory, but then you look at India, you see this out of India theory as well. So, you know, this out of Africa theory is it's not written in stone. That's what I'm saying. There's so much other information in history that predates this theory. You know, we've been taught this, we've been indoctrinated in a lot of this stuff. You know, and a lot of these Afrocentrics, they do not talk about American history. They're talking about African history. And a lot of these Americans, you know, I've never had a brother because you're from here. Okay. And it's important that somebody start talking. And I thank you, Dan Calloway. It's important that someone start talking about the black history in America, talking about American history, okay, and 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 we're not saying that we we don't like our Aborigines from Africa. We're all Aborigines. Let's get out this term African. We're all Aborigines. Let's get out of America. Let's leave these these continents out of it. America and Africa. We're all dark skinned Aborigines. We all had a kinship. And you can see that in this book as well. When you go to read this book, you can see the kinship all the dark races had together because they had some of the same indigenous customs. You know, they were very similar. So it was very easy for them to come together and start intermarrying. All right. So I just had to emphasize that because I've seen, you know, these videos of these Afrocentrics going back and forth, back and forth, especially these Afrocentrics because they have just, some of them have just totally ignored the truth because they are so caught up in this trend. You know, we have to honor our ancestors everywhere, you guys. And, you know, not only do you have African ancestors, if you're claiming that, you also have black Indian ancestors too that your ancestors married married into. So you actually have you may have two of those bloodlines running through you. You know, so you're claiming that Africanness, you might have some American blood in, in you too. You might have some black American Indian blood in you. More than likely, more than likely you do. Okay, I just want to emphasize that. I'm not going to be long with this book review. I'm going to uh, read a couple of pages out of here that I thought that was very, you know, intriguing to me, especially talking about the Black Seminoles. I'm going to start from here, and then I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm going to start from here. On page 56, I think this is chapter 4. Yeah. And really chapter 4 is the best chapter to me. Chapter 4 is the best chapter to me because it really gets into talking about the Black Seminoles. They were fierce warriors. They were on the front line of this Black Indian War. You know, they, they stayed, I think that they, they spanned... They fight and they warred against the United States for about 20 to 30 years. They did not give up. They even went into Mexico and they were uh, they led their army as well. They were so good, the military ended up hiring some of the black Seminoles to fight in, in the United States military. Okay, so 
They were some very, they called them guerrilla war fighters. The, the United States Army just could not, they didn't have any of the fighting skills that these black Indians had. And black Indians seemed to wield power over the red man. They seemed to be great advisors to the red Indians. So you see that close-knitted relationship in this book. I'm going to read this chapter, uh, read this page. And then I'm just going to skip over. I'll probably read maybe two or three pages because I've already kept you long. And I don't want to keep you any longer, okay? The position of black Seminoles, once secured within the nation, now needs strong support from the Seminole chiefs. Divisions enter villages as chiefs argue various courses of action that might leave them in peace. Some Seminole chiefs claim that they now own their black members since they was the only language whites understood. But some who claim this ownership took advantage of it and sent their black villagers off to labor hard in their fields. Seminole law making it impossible to sell a slave remained firmly in place. Seminole chiefs still married black women and had black military and diplomatic advisors. So let me go now. You see how he calls them black? You know, see see that this, see how this author is doing it. See, that's what I don't like right there. Because not once he's trying to separate them from their Indian status by calling them black. All right. So I guess he's referring to these Seminoles as being red men marrying black Indians or black people here. So you see that, you know, this, this say that, see, that's, that's my issue with this book. That's my only issue with this book. But U.S. policy had begun to erode a strong friendship and trust and to bend equality. In the face of their changing relations, some black Seminoles left to form their own settlements in 1822. So you see that the United States started to come in here and make a difference between the red Indian and the black Indians. And some of these red Indians fell forward. And these black Seminoles was like, hey, I'm not having it. I don't want to participate in this. I'm going to go somewhere else. In 1822, the United States Secretary of State reported that in Florida, in Florida, there were five to six hundred maroon Negroes while in the woods. Further south on the peninsula, there were even more. Florida now had a growing number of Maroons who owed allegiance only to themselves. And see, this is what they call these black Seminole. When they mix with the red man and the black man, they still called them Maroons. They weren't noticing them as just plain Indians. They, again, it, it, there's so much colorism that's going on during this time. It's just ridiculous. This colorism was just so big back then. For U.S. slaveholders, the armed uppity black Seminoles were intolerable problem. They owned horses, cattle, hogs, and chickens and tended their own gardens. Worse, they were treated as kindly as family members, which they often were. So they were wanting these red Indians to treat these black Indians like slaves, and they wasn't doing it. They weren't having it. And the United States were mad because they wasn't treating them like slaves. So even though you'll hear that, yeah, some of the red Indians that you see today enslaved black Indians, it wasn't like that. They did that to stop the United States from enslaving them themselves, but they treated them very kindly. And you'll hear that in this book as well. Not many treated them harsh like that. In 1835, U.S. Indian agent Wiley Thompson reported they had equal liberty with their owners. They carried guns, were allowed to travel long distances, and acted impudently free. These were not slaves, complained U.S. masters, but people who kept their African names dressed in Seminole clothing and turbans, adopted Seminole stomp dances, and sang Seminole and African songs. So you hear again, he's, in, he's injected African after he said black. So you see how to interchange, you know, but there was, there were already a, 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 a big amount of black Indians already here. There were a small percentage, maybe 2% African, 3% Africans 
that were uh, that came over here because they were already enslaving indigenous people here. They were already slaving black Aborigine Indians already here. Why go in and bring, because they were already outnumbered by the black Indians here. So why would Europeans bring in an enormous amount of Africans if they can already enslave the darkest races that were already here? So that made more sense. And they surely didn't want to be outnumbered by bringing in more Africans on top of the black indigenous people. All right, they were enslaving us, sending us to different parts uh, of Britain and the other islands as well. So they were changing us around as well and bringing in uh, a small percentage of Africans. In this lenity, slave masters saw a grave gr threat to their own nearby slave system. Seminole sees a revolution might overtake their own plantations and bloody the countryside with racial outbreaks. Florida would not be a fit place for slavery until the Seminole Nation behaved like proper slave owners. So they wanted them to treat them harshly. They wanted that. In 1835, warfare erupted be again between U.S. troops and the Seminoles. One alleged cause was the seizure of U.S. Officer of Chief Osceola Black Wife. Even if this story is more myth, then truth is symbolizes a unity of two races under Osceola, Osceola's command. So again, you see him describing this woman as black. He not saying that she's an Indian, but he calling her black. You know, and this author, I think too, this author is lumping these black people with Africans too, which I think does this book a disservice. A more basic cause of hostilities was the continued US, U.S. use of tricks and force to have Seminole chiefs sign treaties agree, agreeing to leave Florida for reservation land in Arkansas and Oklahoma. When Seminole leaders were tricked into signing a treaty, hostilities broke out. Most of them were black Seminoles. They reasoned that under any U.S. agreement, they would be forced into... Bondage. In 1835, King Philip led a black and red Seminoles in a raid. See? Black and red Seminoles. So you see in the author say black and red uh, Indians. And I'm under the impression that the black Indians here were, are a lot older than the red men. I think the red men came over a little later. I think the black inhabitants were here a lot longer than the red men. That's just my assumption, and a lot, and some more people believe the same too. Chief Osceola led a band that murdered a government agent. Another Seminole column wiped out U.S. Major Francis Day's entire relief force in a famous day massacre. Florida was again in flames. Before this conflict was over, the United States had fought its most costly Indian war, spending over $40 million and losing 1,500 soldiers and many civilians. They battled on enemy, on an enemy one U.S. officer called bold, active, and armed, and black Seminoles, more desperate than Indians. And, and the, mm, that's something that they were saying that. In December 1836, General Sidney Thomas Jessup who had recently assumed command of U.S. forces, decided this, you may be assured, is a Negro and not an Indian war. So he, you know, he tried to call them Negroes. Again, they coming up with these different terms to, you know, and, and, and Negro is nothing but a, it still means black in Spanish. You know what I'm saying? So he's trying to call them by something else. Uh, this General Jessup was a pain in their butt. Because he never honored any treaty with the Black Seminoles. General Jessup became the first commander to recognize the crucial role of Black Seminoles played in the nation. Throughout my operation, I found the Negroes the most active and determined warriors. And during the conferences with the Indian chief, I ascertained that they exercised almost controlling influence over them. So this is another indication to me that the Black Indians were here longer than the red man. And I believe that they had a lot of ownership of this land and they gave a lot of land to the red man. Hey, 
this is what this comes through for me from the ancestors. You know, and, and that's just my opinion. General Jessup first tried to destroy the alliance by assaulting black Seminole villages and holding their women and children hostage. He promised Creek mercenaries plunder, meaning capture blacks who would be sold as slaves. See, and so they trying to get these other Indians in on this. You know what I'm saying? You know, divide and conquer like you're, you know, like colonization always does. The Europeans always use these tactics. In two months, his troops seized 131 blacks, mostly women and children. When his men stormed Osceola's headquarters in January 1837, the chief's personal bodyguard was captured. Of 55 men, 52 were black. These were black Indians. Osceola escaped, but illness would end his life in a year. By 1837, Osceola had become the leader of the black and red resistance to the U.S. slaveholders. While the Seminole Nation as a whole showed signs of the divisions, those who rode with Osceola, such as Wildcat, were prepared to defend the black brothers and sisters to the death. So there was a tight-knit bond between a lot of them. It says, uh, since, since General Jessup's military operations had not captured one significant Seminole leader to negotiate with, he worried that his plans would backfire. The black Seminoles would lead the nation in a full-scale full scale warfare. Worse still, he feared his policy might drive armed black Seminoles to recruit plantation slaves and throw the countryside into disorder. He didn't call them African slaves. Notice that. He called them plantation slaves. Okay? So we have to be very careful with these words when it comes to identifying ourselves. Because there's a lot of wordplay in the English language when it comes to identifying ourselves. So make sure that you're reading things very carefully. Uh... He believed that the Seminole warriors had fought as long as they had life through the influence of leading Negroes. For him, the key to all negotiations became the black Seminoles. Under their own leaders, Negro Abraham and John Horse, or Cohia, in concert with Chief Osceola and Wildcat, black Seminoles pursued their own strategy, wear down U.S. armed might until compromise was possible. And they did that too. I mean, they wore them out. Even though they were a small group of people, they kicked their butts. Uh, finally, on March 6, 1837, both sides signed a treaty granting the Seminoles to keep their Negroes, their bona fide property, should accompany them to the West. Jessup, despite the pressure from the U.S. slaveholders and their political figures, felt he had no choice. The Negroes ruled the Indians. You see what I'm saying? The blacks ruled the Indians. You see what I'm saying? Because this was actually, you, I'm not going to even get into that, but there was a lot of influence. These black Indians had a lot of influence over the red Indians. They were the most fierce warriors now. Uh, and you see that too uh, in some of the Olmec. Sarah Seti, he was showing some of that in some of his video. You would see some of the red Indians would want to be more like the black Indians when it comes to that warrior spirit. And you see some of that too uh, in Japan when it comes to those black ninjas or black warriors. All right. The Negroes ruled the Indians, and it is important that they should feel themselves secure. If they should become alarmed and hold out, the war will be resumed because they he know they was about their life, honey. He know they was about their life, and they didn't mind going to war. But General Jessup was not beyond more tricks. He kept on playing games with them. When Seminoles furnished hostages to seal the agreement, Jessup planned to let slave traders seize them. Hearing of this betrayal, Wildcat and Black Seminole leader John Horace led a daring mission that rescued the hostages. At this point, Seminole Blacks felt free to circulate around the U.S. plantation, urging general uprising against both the U.S. government and the masters. All is lost, and principally, 
by the influence of Negroes, Jessup wrote, he now saw that the two races are identified in interests and feelings. See, he thought it was a gang with them, but they were very bonded together and could not be separated. There was, there was good reason to move Seminoles speedily to the frontier. Should the Indians remain in the territory, the Negroes among them will form a rallying point for the runaway Negroes from the adjacent states. Despite his understanding of the racial alliance the dominate, that dominated the Seminole nation, General Jessup could not conclude peace. He just would leave it alone. He wouldn't leave it alone. He continued to engage in cruel deceptions that violated the flag of truce, and he seized the women and children as hostages. So you see that go on and on in this book. Uh, I'm not going to keep you long. I, I, what else do I want to read? You know. Uh, let me see. It's so many good parts to this book. It's so many good parts to this book. I, I just. It's so many good parts. I don't know where to go. Okay, I'll start here, and then I'm going to uh, conclude this video. They should have earned more than that late gesture to their fallen heroes. Is there any group in history that the beginning before 1776 and stretching from one generation into the next for more than a century and reaching from Florida's marshland to Texas deserts fought harder for liberty and justice in the Americas. The last word about the black Seminole nation should rest with the historic figure. Chief John Horace, I mean, he fought hard, him and Wildcat, I mean, and we, and they don't even talk about them in history. They don't even talk about these people. In December 1873, he and Snake Warrior walked into General Auger's office and entered a plea for my people to have a home. In his most diplomatic language, the chief reminded the general he had fought almost a dozen U.S. generals in Florida. He had negotiated with General Taylor, who became a U.S. president, and with President James Polk in Washington. Still identifying himself as part of the Seminole Wildcat Party, his words were taken down by an army scribe and sent on the adjutant general in Washington. John Horse's oral petition is on file in the National Archives. This is part of what he said. And this is when they start having trouble. Uh, he was seeking a, a treaty, another treaty with them. And so this is what he sent. This is what he sent. I want full rations for my people, please, if so, granted. And I like to have the Mexicans who are intermarried with my people, which are with us, good men may be enlisted for scouting. Because they they uh they led the Mexico Mexican army too for a while. They were able to flee. Mexico gave them what I'm trying to say. I can't even find a word for it. But Mexico allowed them to come there. You know, Mexico allowed them to come, come there when they were running from the United States. And they let the Seminoles come there and the Seminoles agreed to lead their army. And they did a very good job because the United States were trying to go into Mexico, too, and take other black Mexicans. There were black Mexicans there, too. All right. And so they were needing help to fight off some of the. Uh, yeah, they gave them sanctuary. That's the word I'm using. They gave them sanctuary in Mexico. I say for my people that the president of the United States may grant us what the fathers before God have promised us. And I come here, General Arger, to present you all this that you know who we are. General, I come here to make a new treaty and the wish I ask for, please grant, sir. The same time I want to see my children have their right as bought them all here. We come here not to tell a lie, but to tell the whole truth and that you do all for us you can you can't to have a home. And that's what John Horse wrote. Uh, I didn't even scratch the surface of this book. I just read it for a few pages out of here. 
I do recommend this book, but read it very slow so you don't get things intertwined. That's the only thing I didn't like about this book. But I thank you so much for being here with me today. I hope this video was very educational for you, and I hope you enjoyed the book review. Light and love. I hope to see you soon.